welcome everyone to EPF Futures introduction to ESG webinar. Uh, my name is James Simonson. I'm chairing the webinar today. I'm one of the assistant directors at the British Property Federation. Today we've got a great panel. We're going to talk about uh, what ESG is, starting off with a presentation from uh, Will Day from PwC, and then we're going to move into a conversation around um, how ESG principles can be put into practice in the property sector. Um, just a few housekeeping uh, matters. So please feel free to ask questions on the Q&A function and we'll do our best to answer them as they come through. Um, and this webinar is being recorded and will be popped up on our YouTube channel and our website afterwards. To start off with, we've just got a bit of a quick snap poll. And the question is, how much do you know about environmental, social and governance or ESG? While we're waiting for that to pop up, let's go around and do some introductions. So um, I'll start with Will. Would you like to give yourself a quick introduction? Yes, hello, everybody. My name is Will Day. I'm sustainability advisor to PwC and a fellow at the Cambridge Institute of Sustainability Leadership. Uh, I spend most of my time working with people responsible for policy or strategy in businesses and government uh, thinking about uh, the future. Nice. And Annabelle? We'll go to Charlotte next and then we'll come back to Annabelle in a second. Hi everyone, um, so Charlotte Hopkinson, I'm Head of Sustainability and Corporate Social Responsibility for Granger PLC and we are the UK's largest listed residential landlord. Um, so I work closely with um, colleagues and teams all around the business to make sure sustainability is embedded in all of our residential projects. Thanks Charlotte. We'll introduce Annabelle in the meantime. Annabelle is a Sustainability Advisor at, at JLL, um, so she'll be joining us for the second half of of the webinar to talk about how ESG is embedded into mainly the residential side of things. So Will's going to give a, a presentation on ESG, so I'll hand over to Will now for the next 20 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to go very fast now uh, because you're a smart bunch, um, and I'm going to try and answer this question, uh, why does this matter? Uh, the first thing to recognize is that we've only got one of these, but we don't behave as if we've only got one of these. And I think we're beginning to recognize that it's a very complex object and probably unique. And as humans, we derive a whole set of fundamental services from a functioning planet. Uh, you can see climate, energy, food, water and livelihoods and health are the outer circle, things like soil, fertility, wood, fiber, fuel, pollinating insects, water, etc are really where the rubber hits the road. And many of those outer circle services are in very poor condition. This is the more conventional way of looking at the planet. There's the biosphere, the planet, there we are, human society, and there's the economy. And we spend most of our time focused on trying to grow the economy uh, and are rewarded for that, increasingly recognizing that the way that economy functions has a profound impact on society and on the wider environment. This is what we know how to do. We know how to fly that box in uh, and get rewarded for doing so. We know uh, how to encourage people in the nest to demand more things, whether or not they want them. And that's how the economy grows. And, and we're fine at, at, at monitoring and accounting for and reporting on that activity. We've been much less good, and, uh, until recently anyway, at understanding the implications of that activity on the supporting structures, let alone measuring, reporting, uh, and getting a sense of uh, when, when enough is enough. The socket on the right here of the Earth's resource is stubbornly one planet big. It's not going to get any bigger. Uh, the plug of human demand keeps growing. Uh, these things get measured. Uh, there's a day in the year called Earth Overshoot Day, which some of you may be aware of. Calculation is how much do we consume of renewable resources? How much can the planet renew? Where does that line overlap? And in, in 2021, Earth Overshoot Day was July the 29th. So effectively, on July the 30th this year, uh, we will start eroding planetary capital, if we think of it in business terms. That's a global average number. If you look at individual countries' footprints, if we all lived like people in Qatar live, for example, Earth Overshoot Day would be February the 11th. The UK is down at about four o'clock on this graph uh, in the middle of May, alongside a number of uh, other European countries. But every country on this slide is living beyond the carrying capacity of the planet. This is the big picture. On the left, a set of very steep red curves reflecting population growth, GDP growth. You can see the, the lists there, energy consumption, water consumption, and so on. And, and they're very steep, and they are accelerating. And in every case, the little dotted line in each of those graphs is the year 1950. 
So after about 1950, we saw an extraordinary acceleration of socioeconomic activity, and lots of good things flowed from that as well, life expectancy, health, and so on. On the right-hand side is the price effect that nature has paid, uncosted, greenhouse gases released to the atmosphere, the acidification of our oceans, capture of fisheries, loss of tropical forests. Again, 1950, uh, that vertical dotted line. I want to look at a couple of those because they really do underpin ESG. That's all the water on the planet brought together in one place. If you empty the oceans and melt the ice caps, every kind of pond and puddle. And I never think that looks like very much water when you consider that every living thing depends upon it. And 97% of that sphere is salt water. Uh, and of the fresh water, uh, you can see there, the vast majority on the left-hand side, the vast majority is frozen, and we have no interest in accessing that. Were we be, be so foolish as to melt all of that ice, the oceans would rise by 70 meters. Uh, very inconvenient. So the amount of fresh water available to us, uh, which is expanded on the right-hand side here, as you can see, the vast majority of that is underground. And that's kind of one-way trip water. Once you pumped water up, particularly from deep aquifers, it can take a very, very, very long time to percolate back down into the ground. Much of it goes into the oceans. We use water for almost everything. Here's a link between water and food. You can see I've got a cup of coffee in front of me. Behind that cup of coffee sits about 140 liters of water to get it here to me, grow it process it and so forth. Once you start converting vegetable protein into animal proteins, as you can see on the bottom line, then you get very big numbers. So, so a half kilo, so a pound of beef steak, can take up to four and a half cubic meters of water uh, to put on your plate. It's why if you ever come to Cambridge, one of our, our programs there, we will not serve you beef. Why does that matter? It matters because of this, because we've got a growing population, we need, we need to feed it, and we're going to need to produce more food in the next 40 years than has been produced in the last eight to 10,000 years. That's a stretch target. It's a stretch target, not least for water, but also because less than 10% of the world's land area is suitable for growing food on. Uh, so the rest of it, we have forests and, and mountains and deserts and ice, inappropriate we can graze some of it but basically arable land and what we do with land matters so the link between food and water and land is pretty clear i'm going to put energy in here on the left hand side is the where we use fossil fuel energy for to produce food and you can see production transport processing and so on uh, to get a certain amount of food energy out and that might be uh, quite efficient we can get more efficient in our use of fossil fuels and we'll need to replace it as you will come to in a minute. But the purpose of this slide is to ask what will happen to the price of food if the price of fossil fuel goes up or down? And the answer is they are in lockstep, effectively. There's the price of food, there's the price of fossil fuel or oil in this case. It's over 90% correlation uh, between the two things. And it's a system, and I want to highlight the fact that if you are going to change your energy system or demand more food, uh, you're going to have an impact on all of the other things, um, hugely interlocked. And we are dealing with a set of systemic issues which underpin the ESG concern. Let's talk about people. The, the pink line here is the rate of annual rate of the world's population, which, as you can see, since about the mid-1960s, has been in steep decline and is projected to decline to the end of the century. We're at about 7.8 billion people now. We're headed for just under 11 billion by the end of the century. And by 2050, we expect to add about another 2 billion people. We're on a steep uh, curve, which is a consequence of that, in, of that rapid population growth in the 50s and 60s. Where will those people be? Well, the blue circles are 1950 population. The red is the end of the century. That's the 11 billion world. So as you can see, there's large chunks of the world where population will be flat or stagnant or even going backwards, Europe, Russia, Japan, and chunks of the world where there'll be dramatic increases. So South Asia, Middle East, and Sub-Saharan Africa stand out. So that 2 billion additional people, where are they going to be? Well, what proportion of those do we think will live in cities in what we now term as developing economies or developing countries? And the answer is at least all of them. So the population of cities in the developing world expected to increase by at least 2 billion people in 30 years. That is six times the population of North America. So who's going to be building those? And are they going to look like this? 
Uh, China is building cities for millions of people at a time, rapid urbanization happening in China. Or is it going to look like this, the Matari Valley in Nairobi, unplanned shanty slum, call it what you will, cities globally grow at about 200,000 people a day, and much of that is into unplanned places like this. And if you want an ideal circumstance in which, for example, to spread a pandemic, uh, then have your population <coughs> move into this kind of accommodation. Given the pressure on land, are we going to do this? This is Hong Kong. Um, do we go up? Uh, it looks pretty soulless to me. Uh, it's a real building, by the way, not a Photoshop. Have we got space to do this? for 9 billion people, uh, let alone 11 billion people? Probably not. I, I actually think that this is another real picture. It looks almost as dispiriting as the, as the car block, in my view, but um, I'm not convinced we have room to do this. Let's switch gear a bit. Climate change. This is PwC's More London office at London Bridge. Um, and some time ago, I asked them if we couldn't show people what a ton of CO2 looked like. So they did their calculations and they blew up a big balloon. And that's, what, that's the volume of a ton of CO2. And we release billions of tons of these into the atmosphere every year. And the atmosphere is not very deep. If you were to drive from central London, for example, to Bath, and you made, made that journey vertically and not along the ground, before you got to Bath, you would be outside uh, the, the atmosphere. So it's, it's thin. My colleagues at the British Antarctic Survey uh, show me <clears throat> that uh, we've been steadily emitting more and more global CO2 emissions, the dotted line on the left. Uh, last year was a weird year because of COVID. So our CO2 emissions dropped uh, uh, and uh, needless to say, they've accelerated again. But in order to stay safe, uh, and they've defined that as limiting global temperature increases to 1.5 degrees, we've got to basically hit net zero by the middle of the century globally. And then we've got to remove emissions from the atmosphere for the rest of the century. Uh, we don't have the technology yet to do that. <clears throat> 1880 was a hot year in West Africa. You can see here the red circles are more than two degrees hotter than normal. Blue circles, two degrees. Uh, cooler than normal. Look what happened since 1880. It's worth looking. Remember the 1950 acceleration curves. Twenty seventeen, twenty eighteen, twenty nineteen, and twenty twenty amongst the hottest years on record. But interestingly, the real change hasn't really happened until the last, I don't know, thirty years or so. Twenty years certainly, ten definitely. So people are starting to notice it. And consequences: the shorthand for climate change is we're going to get hotter hots, colder colds, drier dries, and wetter wets. And from a property perspective, that means flooding and subsidence. Where do these uh, problems come from? Well, CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide, the three main greenhouse gases. And the middle column there shows us where they come from. And, and you know, inconveniently, it's from the entire economy, not just from one bit of it. And if you look in there, you can see road, air, and ship transport at the top. But then cooling and heating our buildings is a big chunk of global emissions. And then a bit further down, iron, steel, cement, uh, and so on, construction materials, a significant chunk. So. Uh, everything in orange and red there is going to have to be reduced to zero. And, and the reason for that is because the green and the purple land use and agriculture at the bottom, which produce methane and nitrous oxide, are going to be more difficult and we'll need to de decarbonize everything else and then work out how we do the hard bits but back to the food conversation. And often, if we're looking at where our carbon is in our own footprint, the operational emissions are a mod very modest proportion of the whole. Our supply chains often are where the devil lurks. We're seeing a huge changes at the moment. You can see here, uh, we lost almost 270 billion tons of ice a year for the last 20 years. To give you an idea, in 2019, Greenland lost a million tons of water a minute for the entire year. And the consequence of that, of course, is that sea level is rising, combination of water flowing into it and thermal expansion as it warms up. If we hold the global temperature to two degrees globally, you can see the very darkest blue countries here, between 75 and 100% of the population of those countries currently live on land that will be flooded. 
And if you look at Australia, New Zealand, and much of the Far East, between 25 and 50% of the population currently live on land that will be flooded under, under two degree uh, increase. So this is a profound uh, risk. We've got lots of politics happening. <clears throat> That's good. It takes time and effort. And of course, nothing like a conference to bring in a set of um, new regulations. So expect a significant regulation and tougher uh, pledges uh, from governments around the world. It'll be needed because if you look at how the, about the quality of current policy, most of the world, most government policies around the world are inadequate or insufficient or highly or critically insufficient to meet those Paris goals. Are we going to use artificial intelligence technology to save us? Well, yes, that's going to be a hugely important part of it, uh, but by no means will it solve the problems on its own. We can, of course, point technology towards solving these major problems, and we're going to need to. Um, what percentage of the of jobs at risk? That's the risk, the kind of the sting in the tail of, uh, of of automation and technology is that it's estimated that something under half the world, just under half the world's jobs, could be automated or computerized if we chose to. As far as buildings concerned, we're seeing bits of this: fewer people paddling around in uh, in cement and more people building uh, buildings in uh, in factories and and prefab and modular construction. Uh, efficient in lots of ways. But it does mean that people worry about the future of their jobs. Edelman Trust Barometer this year, 80, over 80% 80 people worried about losing their jobs for a lack of the right sorts of skills, immigration, automation, jobs being shifted overseas. This is very unsettling. And globally, we're seeing a significant increase in income inequality. The rich are getting spectacularly richer and the poor, even if they're improving their lot, are not doing so nearly as fast and are feeling the gap uh, uh, badly. We're seeing a lot more of this happening. We're seeing a million people on the streets of cities around the world saying, this is not working for me. I could ask you which city this is, and you could probably give me 10 or 15 cities in the last 18 months uh, where a million people have got in the streets to say something's not working. This happens to be Santiago in Chile, but it could be Black Lives Matter, it could be Gilets Jaunes, it could be a whole lot. Uh, the system doesn't seem to be allowing for the outlet of people's frustrations and concerns. The World Economic Forum looks at global risks from a business perspective every year. Top right is high likelihood, high impact. None of those will surprise you. Uh, what, the ones that interest me are these ones. These are higher than average likelihood, and they are heading towards the top right-hand corner. And it, although the highest risk ones are environmental primarily, uh, you can see livelihoods crisis, social cohesion erosion, migration, youth disillusionment, a set of social issues are riding up towards at uh, the top right hand corner. We should be concerned about those, not least because they are very connected. And if you think you're going to solve all the problems by simply having a decent carbon footprint, uh, please think again, because these things are very connected. The E and the S and the G are not distinct separate silos. They are the same issue. At the heart of this is a, is a, a model really which is, does this. This is an electric drill. It's got copper and lithium and plastic and steel in it. And, and when one is sold in the UK, it's estimated it gets used on average for its entire life for 17 minutes. And then it sits on a shelf and we've all got one at home. And, and the reason is when the customer walked into the store, they didn't want a drill, they wanted a hole in the wall. But, but the factory is rewarded for building more drills and the shop is rewarded for selling more drills and they all sit on our shelves. So there's something fundamentally wrong about the linear economy in a, in a material scarce world where we take stuff out of nature, put it together, sell it, and then put it on the shelf. When we need clearly a, a circular economy where we identify where value sits and how it can be retained. And that's absolutely in the construction of building industry. It's absolutely about, about redesign and fit for purpose. Lots of innovation happening on the left, the, currently the tallest timber constructed building in the world in Norway, no structural steel or cement. On the right hand side, planned for Tokyo, 1100 feet tall, no structural steel or, or concrete plan for that building and that's happening a lot and if you look at the global clean tech 100 for example an annual review of kind of the smartest and best startups what's really interesting firstly it's global secondly what they're doing is solving real problems uh, and and if you ask them about that what they're doing is they've identified what needs to change and they are changing it they won't all succeed but i always get uh, kind of genuinely heartened when i go and look at the quality of thinking and the amazing innovation that is happening 
Uh, central bankers got it fairly quickly, Mark Carney amongst the first. He said, look, the far-sighted amongst you, anticipating broader global impacts of climate change on pop property, migration, political stability, food and water security. Uh, hugely important. He did that. He said that several years ago, but just before he left the Bank of England recently, he was a bit pithier. He said, firms ignoring the climate crisis will go bankrupt. And I think that is exactly right. Larry Fink from BlackRock, representing one of the biggest uh, piles of money in the world, now demanding that their investee companies say how they're going to deal with net zero. And how is it in your plan? And how is it in your strategy? And how are your directors sorting it out? Uh, this is investors saying, we need you to tell us how you're going to survive this. Not least because you're going to have to report on it. And TCFD, voluntary at the moment, but not for long. Uh, TNFD, looking at natural capital, is coming soon. So companies will be obliged to and regulated if they don't uh, understand and then report on their exposure to these risks. The International Energy Agency, a couple of months ago, an absolutely extraordinary new report from them in the sense that they've always slightly defended the status quo. And what they basically said is, look, no more, no more fossil fuel boilers, all buildings carbon zero ready, all best in class appliances, 50% of existing buildings retrofitted, 85% zero carbon ready of buildings, 50% of heating met by uh, heat uh, uh, demand, heating met, met heat pumps. These are, this is a absolute ratcheting up of expectations which will turn into policy. And of course, we've got to retrofit uh, not just North Lanarkshire, which is where this is, but every building we've got uh, that's been built. Uh, and lots of those buildings were built at a time when insulation wasn't considered necessary and it was about cheap housing, throw, throw it up, and, and they will need to change. Again, Larry Fink at BlackRock, interesting on ESG. Climate change is already having a disproportionate impact on low-income communities around the world. Does that make it an E issue or an S issue? He's highlighting the fact that E and S and G are not distinct. They are the same thing. And interestingly, money is also looking at whether or not they can even stay in certain sectors. This is BNP Paribas. It's obvious we'll have to exit relationship with at least 30 to 50% of our current clients in the power generation business, which means that companies like BP are redefining themselves uh, from an international oil company to an integrated energy company is their shift Total has rebranded itself from Total to Total Energies as part of the shift away from where it is to where it needs to be. And one of the reasons they're doing that, if you look at market cap comparisons on the right hand side, look how those huge oil majors have shrunk and look how the clean energy leaders have grown. Money is shifting and fast. And it's doing so through various techniques, including bonds that reflect social or environmental uh, improvements. Uh, one of the fastest growing uh, areas in finance, still not as big as uh, the rest of the market, but catching up fast. And one of the reasons, of course, is that if you're good at ESG, you tend to be a better managed company. I always think ESG is a proxy indicator for a well-run business. If you're thinking about and doing things about your footprints, your social impact, and you're doing that responsibly and well, you are likely to be doing other things well as well. It is, as far as I'm concerned, like a litmus test of a well-run business. Sitting in the background to all of this, of course, uh, opportunities, uh, the calculations around the sustainable UN Sustainable Development Goals is that the, the opportunities to get the, these things right uh, are, will offer opportunities of many, many, many trillions of dollars per annum. This is not just about pr producing delay and cost. ESG is about being relevant and resilient. William Wilberforce was a graduate of the University of Cambridge. We're very proud of him. And uh, he, of course, was taking on slavery. And he said, having heard all of this, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say you did not know. Now, he and a small group of people were taking on what was effectively the economic underpinning of the economy of the UK and of many other countries at the time, which was slavery. Very strong moral case there. I would argue that there's a same, similar sort of issue around climate change and social inequality. Uh, the impact of one's activity, our activities is felt way beyond our borders. I think we have a responsibility not just to do the right thing, but we can do well by doing it. Thank you very much indeed. That was very rushed and I will stop now and stop sharing my screen. Thanks so much, Will. That was a brilliant, um, if not terrifying presentation. So turning to our sector's role in delivering solutions and preventing what would be a human 
and climate catastrophe um, over the coming decades. Let's look at how ESG is put into practice into the property sector. Um, so I'll start with Charlotte. Could you give us an overview of what Grange is doing um, on the ESG front? Yeah, thanks, James. Um, so we have a very integrated business model at Granger. So we do our own um, development, our own investment and our own operation of our buildings. So really for us, ESG is about integrating um, all of the environmental, social and governance requirements into everything we do. So into our core business processes. So, for example, if we're acquiring a new building, um, we've got sustainability criteria built into those investment criteria that we consider to make sure that we are acquiring a building that is is reaching the right sustainable credentials for us. And um, similarly, when we're designing a new building to develop ourselves, ESG is integrated into our standard specifications. So by doing it that way, it becomes part of everybody's core role. And we have the experts in their own fields integrating sustainability into what they do, rather than it being seen as a kind of add-on and a, an addition to people's day jobs. If I can turn to you again, I wanted to ask, um, so Will mentioned that we have a huge retrofitting task ahead of us. Um, I think there's statistics that are commonly thrown out that the vast majority of buildings that people will live and work in um, in 30 years time already exist. So we can't solve the problem by building new buildings alone. Um, what are some of the challenges that Granger faces in uh, retrofitting and managing older stock versus newer stock? Yeah, so I think first of all, it's about data. And when you've got an older building um, and it was built before we had building regulations, before we had planning requirements, we don't even have the data necessarily on that building and how sustainable it is. So we might not know how much insulation are in the walls of that building. So that can make it, you know, even the baseline of understanding where we're what we've got and what we need to do is quite challenging. Um, data as well, um, in terms of older buildings, quite often we have um, individual homes, um, the lack of control that the landlord has over those because um, the resident in situ water and energy means we can't really verify how much energy that building is using pra in practice. We can't verify um, what it's doing in terms of um, social impact because we're not even in some cases able to sort of attend that site and, and visit um, and assess the, the in-use performance of that asset. Um, space can be a really important factor as well. Lots of older properties will be smaller um, and some of the new technologies that we will need to, to retrofit into our existing buildings require more space. So a heat pump will take up a lot more room than a gas boiler does. Um, the supporting infrastructure, um, it might be underfloor heating um, that you need to install. You simply haven't got the space, you haven't got the depth um, to do that. So that is also something that we, we need to consider. Um, and just variety of stock where you have um, a very diverse portfolio with different ages of stock, it makes it difficult to, to know what you're working with and to plan a, a strategy for your whole portfolio, I think. Great. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, Annabelle, so did you want to give us a bit of an overview on what JLL is doing um, on ESG? Yeah, so uh, firstly, it's kind of like two parts. It's firstly what we're doing as a company ourselves. Um, so we have our sustainability strategy called Building a Better Tomorrow, which is embedded into the, everything that we do and helps us kind of drive impactful and sustainable change. Um, we also manage, I think, 4.6 billion square feet of space globally. So that's kind of an, our area of like greatest opportunity to affect change. And there's also what we do with our clients. Um, we kind of set uh, strategies for them, um, looking at like products, services and tools and um, technologies available to them to achieve their sustainability goals. My worry is that when the more uh, companies understand about uh, where the kind of laggards are in their own portfolios, the less likely they are to spend the money to build them up and they'll sell them. And they'll sell them to people who'll be much less thoughtful about this stuff and make a quick buck. So, you know, there's a real choice, I think, coming up for the sector, which is what do you do with, with older buildings, yeah. which clearly, you know, it, you know it, do you put in a district heating scheme for something which is kind of a big upfront cost with a long-term benefit? 
I think it's going to be very interesting to see not just how the numbers work, but how the policy and strategy decisions are taken. Do we hang on to this and make it better, or do we lose it while we can and give it to somebody who might not worry quite so much about it? The regulation will catch up in due course with those, and, 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 and nobody wants to be left with a stranded asset, effectively a stranded asset, like the oil and gas industries are threatened with. So I, I think there are some interesting decisions that the sector is going to need to take uh, and quite soon quite honestly because a number of these regulations as you saw from the IEA report are now starting to uh, to ratchet up and I don't think there's a place for really inefficient buildings for much longer. Yeah thanks Will and that's one of the problems that that we've been grappling with at the BPF uh, from a housing perspective is that um, the institutional private rented sector or the private rented sector as a whole um, has regulations for minimum energy efficiency standards, but the owner occupier market currently doesn't at this point. And, and um, you're right in that uh, selling off property from the PRS into owner occupier market essentially avoids, um, you know, the retrofitting to improve energy efficiency. And then the wider problem of energy efficiency in our built environment isn't being addressed. So. Um, Charlotte, I wonder if I can ask, sometimes we talk about the difference um, in progress on the ESG between commercial and residential. Um, I wondered if you had any insights as to whether commercial or residential are further ahead of each other and, and why that might be. Yes, I think the residential sector has always had a really strong focus on the S element of ESG. Um, you have a really close relationship with a resident because you're dealing with their home where they spend so much of their time. So that's quite well embedded in what most residen most residential organisations will be delivering. Um, I think we're, we're a little bit behind, it's fair to say, on the E. Um, some of that is demand driven because um, where you're building office blocks and you will often have an occupier who will demand a certain level of sustainability certification um, and that's quite easy to deliver. In residential we haven't got that same demand driver because sustainability is an important consideration for um, residential tenants but it's not one of the core few things that their decision in where to rent. It's not quite up there with price, location, space, design yet. That We may see that change in the future but I think that that does create some challenges. Um, also, I think there's a, a little bit more of a gap between the landlord and the tenant in residential in terms of the environmental side of things. So our residents buy their own energy and have control over how much energy they use. Um, it's much more difficult for us to even measure how much energy they're using um, in their apartments, um, let alone to sort of help drive and influence how they're using their energy. Um, so there's definitely some some more work to be done there as a sector and I think in collaboration with government on on making it easier to measure actual sort of in use performance in residential and really we've got a great opportunity to learn from the commercial sector um, who I think are really starting to look at that in a new way um, and to take some learnings from them to apply that to what we do in residential. Thanks Charlotte. We might try one of the polls again. In your day job are you required to think about and implement environmental, social and governance uh, principles and outcomes. So that poll has just popped up on your screen. There's yes, a lot, yes, a little or no. So if you submit your answers and we can report back on um, spread of answers in a little bit. So moving on to looking at integrating ESG across the sector. So we know that we talked about the difference between commercial and residential in terms of progress, but I wondered, um, for the panel as an industry where are we at with ESG um, is it a commonly accepted approach um, to asset management to reporting or is there still some convincing to be done um, from our peers in in other companies Annabelle I might turn to you first I think as an industry we're getting there I think there's still a lot more convincing to be done a lot of companies I feel are doing some things but they're kind of not where they need to be. Looking at next generation data, we found that a 16% increase in house builders in terms of introducing some form of target around GHG emissions since last year. But they've also, from this data, found that more action is required in like decarbonizing homes, especially with the shift to more home working. This is going to rise up the agenda. And we've also seen that over a third of house builders have now introduced targets around kind of reducing water consumption. But the there's a lack of clarity over the targets and the data and how they're doing on this. So I kind of think as an industry, we are, we're on the way, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. A lot more that can be done. And Charlotte, can I get your perspective on, on that? 
Yes, I definitely agree with that. I think there is more to be done. And I think Will touched on a bit, a bit before that we still have quite a short term focus to asset management in, in some cases in the sector. And we need to get better at thinking about the long term impacts of our decision making. You know, we need to build assets that are going to be around for another 100, 200 years. We need to probably do more retrofit and more redevelopment rather than knocking down and building new from scratch. And we need to invest in the long term social fabric of the communities where we're operating more. And I think for me, a really important next step for the sector really is to embed it a lot more in the financial side of things, in our valuations, so it can start impacting on rents and, and property values. And that I think will really see that change in terms of integrating it fully into, into the core business strategy and business making. And Will, what's your what's your assessment of where the property sector is at in the ESG? So, so the caveat is I'm not a property expert but but i've been i have spoken in the last few years to and really quite a lot of property companies uh at, at various in kind of various stages in the in the chain from construction and building up to um you know to developers and and two or three things i think are interesting the first thing is you're a sector still which has got a curious number of family-owned businesses still or at least they've got family names at the top and quite strong family link so they tend to think generationally and some of those have been thinking because they inherited the you know from grandpa and father and will pass it on to daughter and granddaughter or expect to so there's something about the nature of ownership in some bits of the sector which i think are really interesting around esg that's the first thing the second thing is uh, and it's often used as an excuse that the original the initial conversation between a developer and a builder or a, somebody thinking to acquire property is is that the original conversation is fueled by genuinely often thoughtful strategy around sustainability and ESG and then it gets handed to the negotiators and all that stuff gets stripped out uh, you know we're building a building or a, or a development or a whatever it might be and the original plans the architects and the and the and the, and the, and the cl and their client had lovely plans with rainwater catchment and porous pavements and and you know zero carbon this that the other and then it gets handed over to the commercial guys whose incentives are very different and the end result is that a lot of that is seen as cost rather than as investment and gets stripped out as part of that kind of rather hard knuckled uh, process about coming up with a price at the end i'm hoping that that's that's changing a bit but it but that's definitely as a, as an observer that's definitely been part of the issue the, the result is you end up not with a camel, but you end up with an inevitable compromise. And that compromise is often at the expense of the things that we might see from this conversation as being important for the long term of that of that company, of, of that kind of of that development. It may be that development's being built to sell, in which case the interest in it stops very quickly. Absolutely. And um I think we need to definitely shift the the focus um with regard to ESG as being a nice to have, being an essential part of every um, construction and development that we do. Um, we've had a question come in around policy and regulation, which we'll touch on in a minute, but I wanted to ask the panel, um, how can we encourage others in the sector to take ESG seriously? Um, you would hope that if Will was to present his presentation to everyone, that they would act straight away because um, it is very, very um, terrifying. Um, but how do we talk to others in the sector about ESG? Is it through a risk mitigation perspective um, or another perspective? I might turn to Will first, if you've got any comments on how we convince people to act. It's always difficult to know the combination of stick and carrot. Uh, the stick one, I think, is fairly easy. There are risks that the people, there are new risks and risks emerging every day, and they're not just environmental, they're social as well, about expectations. Of, of the sector and of individual products and companies, I think regulation is going to come sweeping in. So, you, you know, you can you can be a follower or a leader in this one if you want to. Uh, it's, it's often more expensive. I mean, there are risks associated with both being leader and being follower. Um, but it seems to me that there's only one direction for regulation, and that is it's going to get tighter. And so you might just as well be ahead of the curve as behind the curve uh, would, be my, would be my view. And Annabelle, from your perspective, um, what needs to be done to encourage you know our peers in the industry to to act on ESG and sustainability? So I'd agree with what Will said in terms of like regulation and risk being a driver. I also think there needs to be the element of showing them the financial benefits of kind of being ahead of the curve than behind the curve. Um, 
we did a study recently with JLL um, on looking at kind of buildings that had BREM outstanding or excellent. And those that had it had a 12% rental premium than those without any kind of building certifications. So I think that just shows that within the market, there's definitely scope for it and there's an appetite and the financial benefits will be reaped if kind of measures are implemented. So I think it's showing that side as well. And Charlotte, anything to add? Yeah, I'd agree with that. We definitely need more data on the business case to be able to share that and, and make sure that gets fully integrated into business decision making. I think we also need to focus much more on behaviour change. You know, there's lots of evidence now that we can't do this as landlords on our own. We need to bring the end users, the residents, the visitors to shopping centres, the users of offices with us on that journey. Um, they will make the real difference in terms of really sort of getting to those final bits in terms of GHD reduction or, you know, positive social value delivery. So for me, it's about collaborating and building those really strong relationships all the way down the value chain. Great, thanks. So I've had a question come through, um, quite a short one, um, but that's quite poignant. Is greenwash an issue in the property sector? I wonder if anyone has any perspectives on that um, on the panel. I suspect greenwash might be an issue across uh, the economy, um, but I wonder specifically. Well, I, I, I actually think Pamela's question earlier touches on this a bit. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, there's a lot of house building going a, 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 around us here down in Kent. And I look at the buildings going up and I look for traces of you know, responsible construction around, around environment. And it's, it's tokenism. I mean, they're really, you know, I don't, they're being built around the motor car. I, I don't see any charging, electric charging points being put in. I don't, occasional panel on a roof, but it's not, the, the buildings aren't being designed with that in mind. They, they're add-ons later. So, uh, so to, to a degree, I don't think that getting the footprint of a new building right is featuring, it doesn't appear to be featuring very high at all in the construction that's going on around me. It, they, will, they will plant a tree or two, but you know, I don't, I don't see it being integral in terms of transport links, in terms of facilities, in terms of the physical construction of the buildings. It feels like an add-on. So, so anonymous atten attendee, I, I, I slightly share your concern. Thanks, Will. Annabelle? Yeah, I do agree with that. But um, having coming from working from a for a property developer for the last five years and implementing um, ESG, I do think there are there is an element of kind of tokenism. But some developers are doing things, um, and there is a drive. But as you said, commercial have a have another idea of what they want. Things are getting value engineered out. But I do believe that people are doing things, um, just maybe not at the speed we would like to see it being done. Thanks, Annabelle. So we touched on uh, regulation just before and Pamela's question, um, which was, are the policy and regulation drivers in the residential development sector sufficient to encourage or require developers to implement net zero or lower carbon heating systems? A lot of new housing seems to have a token gesture of PV roof panels, but ultimately still rely on gas boilers. So what's the best way to speed up and move away from fossil fuels? Charlotte, I wonder if you might comment on where we're at in terms of government regulation. So um, thinking about the PRS, we've got the minimum energy efficiency standards, the future home standards. Um, how much of a drive is that regulation uh, giving um, and how much is left for um, the private sector to do to meet these goals? I think it is a big driver, but I think it's too short term. So we know what the minimum energy efficiency standards are for sort of a few years time. We don't know what the long term ambition looks like. Similarly, the future home standard we know will apply in 2025, but we won't know exactly what's required until 2023. Um, we obviously, as a sort of long term owners of our assets, want to redevelop our assets over the long term. We want to plan in a refurbishment in advance. We don't want to have to do multiple retrofits install one technology today which might then turn out tomorrow to have been the wrong one so what we're really looking for is sort of much more longer term visibility from government um, and i think that's really important with the the low carbon heating conversation um, huge job that the industry is going to have to do to to remove gas boilers from almost every single home in the uk and switch over to a new technology we know there will need to be a range of technologies we use to to meet the requirements of different individual properties but visibility now on what those preferred technologies are will really help because it's going to be a huge investment program 
over the long term. And I think in terms of ex existing stock, there isn't much regulation. So all we've got really is the minimum energy efficiency standards. And we know meeting a certain EPC level is not an accurate portrayal of a property's actual performance. There's also big, um, big um, swathes of the sector that aren't actually covered by that legislation. So you've mentioned before the owner occupier market, um, even some types of properties aren't legally required to have EPCs and certain types of, of long term tenancies have never had to have uh, an EPC. So that's not going to drive change across the sector as a whole. And I think for the commercial sector as well, they have this, they have a similar a similar issue with the EPC um, format, the way it, it doesn't measure actual performance, whether there's a big gap between predicted and actual performance. And, as a sector as a whole, we need to we need to find a way around that and work closely with government to work out how best to actually measure performance and to, to improve all of these properties that need improving over the long term. Thanks, Charlotte. Will or Annabelle, anything to add on the regulation side of things? Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, just kind of following up on what Charlotte said with the EPCs, I was recently talking with a group of like SME developers um, and they were saying that EPCs are kind of no longer fit for purpose. They're not really weighted appropriately for certain renewable technologies. So things like PVs aren't weighted as highly as gas boilers or things like that. So where you would expect to see better kind of a, a better weighting, it's not. So kind of saying that they're just no longer fit for what we need them for. Thanks, Annabelle. Well, I wonder if we could get the results of the poll that we had. Um, earlier onto the screen if possible. So we've got 28% saying that they uh, think about or implement ESG in their day job a lot. 52% a little, so a lot in the middle there. And then 20% no. Um, and that segues nicely into sort of our final conversation. So we know that ESG is going to have to become a pivotal and crucial part of everyone's job going forward. It won't just be reserved for um, the professionals like yourselves in your organisations who are designated to think about sustainability and ESG. I wonder if if BPF Futures members were interested in, in a career in a more designated ESG sustainability space in the meantime, though, how might they go about that? So I guess what I'm asking is, how did you all get into your jobs? And what uh, tips or tricks would you have for people listening about how to get into that, into the ESG space? Um, we might start with uh, Annabelle first. Yes, so I kind of did it in a very roundabout way. I did a degree in environmental management, but I came out of university and it was a recession. So I kind of took a side step into some admin role, but I persevered and I went in through a mains contractor and started picking up sustainability. And then I moved to a property developer, again, an admin role and a site-based role. And I learned all about it from the site and actual implementation and eventually got into the sustainability field and then I worked in that for the last five years kind of just doing all the implementation and then moved a couple of months ago to JLL for a consultancy side. I guess my biggest tips are persevere if it's something that you're you know I'm really passionate about something that I knew I wanted to do just persevere there's no harm in taking a sideways step if that's what you need to get into something if you like if you like a company and you like what they're doing that's not necessarily the role take take something different to kind of get your foot in the door and yeah just just keep on pushing it's a really great role and the benefits are well worth it thanks Annabelle uh, come to you Charlotte next yeah, so um, I have only been in the property industry for about eight years, but I've always been in the sustainability industry. And I, I found experience really invaluable in getting that first role and that first into the industry. Um, and that actually came through some extracurricular volunteering that I did whilst at university. So I'd encourage everyone to think outside the box of how you can get some experience, whether it's approaching your in-house sustainability team to see how you can help them, a specific project relevant to your area of the business that you can volunteer to work on, or, you know, if you're doing your APC, you can choose to take sustainability to level two or three competency, which will be a good way to get some practical experience. Um, and I would, in terms of tips, I would think about what your niche is in terms of sustainability. It's a really broad field. So try and narrow down which aspect is of interest to you. For me, it was the social side. And my previous role before I entered property was actually working for Disney and looking at the labor standards that they have in their factories for producing Disney merchandise. So 
I applied for a role in social impact um, in the property sector and that was how I got in. So think about what you're really personally passionate about and what you know what you can make as your sort of unique selling point really um, would be my tip. And Charlotte, a fascinating transition from Disney into the property industry, that's for sure. Um, and Will? Well, my experience is of almost no relevance whatsoever because it started so long ago that the world is a different place. But um, I, I started my career as a humanitarian relief worker in, in East Africa uh, ages ago and came to the conclusion that the opposite of poverty was prosperity, not charity, but, but that the system was broken. And, and once you've understood or once you kind of that Pandora's box is open, then, then the wider system becomes an object of interest and it remains so. And I still struggle with who does what best, whether it's companies or governments or us as volunteers and, and citizens. So I still struggle with that. But the role of the market is hugely important. And once you've understood that the social and the environmental and the and the commercial have to work together better, then it becomes common sense. I, you know, I don't like the sustainability word or particularly the ESG title. I like the phrase common sense because companies that understand this will do better will do a better job for themselves and for their customers and their clients and the planet so so that for me i i apologize to all of you who've got sustainability in your job titles i hope that in due course it doesn't matter where you sit in a business you'll be doing this as as naturally as breathing because it'll be the way that good businesses are run and operated and I, the risk at the moment of having sustainability experts, which we need at, at this stage, is everybody else says, yeah, we do sustainability really well. They do it in that cupboard over there, uh, which means that I don't have to. Uh, and, and that's not where ESG needs to be or go. So the sooner we can broaden the horizon. If you're interested in the subject, there are courses you can do. You know, there are there are skills you need to understand. And we, but we need to be able to make the business work in accordance with some rules and, and regulations that are coming. And in, 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 in you know, connection with, with basic common sense about our footprint and the need for our product or our service. Thanks, Will. Um, and thanks, everyone, for your insights there. Um, we might wrap it up now. We've got a couple of minutes left. So um, if anyone has any quick questions, feel free to pop them up into the Q&A uh, section and we can answer them either now or after the webinar is finished. A reminder again that this session will be, uh, has been recorded and it will be uploaded. So if you need a refresher or want to share that with your colleagues, um, please do. Um, so thank you everyone for attending. Um, we'll give you a couple of minutes back uh, of your day. Um, thanks to Annabelle, Charlotte and Will for participating and we'll see you at the, the next webinar. Thanks everyone. Thank you.